strength in our own way. Center us back to you, Lord. Center us back to your way. I pray as I unpack your word now, Lord, that you would speak to your people now. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Please do take a seat. If you don't know me, my name is Will. I'm part of the team here. And yeah, it's great to be able to come and talk to you um, this evening as we continue um, to go through our series on the Gospel of Mark, slowly going through the passages to take a deep dive into what God might be saying to us, both individually and as a church. And Steve preached last week about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan and also about the kingdom of God and how we can play our part in God's kingdom. And here tonight, we're going to look at some earlier passages before that. That same spirit who sent Jesus into the wilderness that we learned about last week is the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, that comes upon Jesus as he is baptized in the River Jordan. So tonight, we're going to look at Mark 1, 9 to 11. So let's read it together. It should appear on the screens. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And if you're taking notes this evening, um, I guess the title of this message is The Power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder what your thoughts are when the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Maybe you're like, yes, sign me up to the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. I love the encounter moments. I love the signs, the wonders and miracles. Or maybe you're sitting here this evening and you're feeling, well, maybe I don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. I've heard about the Holy Spirit, but I'm not sure who he is. I get God the Father, I get his Son, Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit, I'm less so sure. And that was my experience kind of growing up, attending church as a kid. The Holy Spirit was something of an enigma to me. At Sunday school, there was lots of talk about God the Father who created heaven and earth. He called on Noah to build the ark and called on Moses to lead the people. And likewise, there was also a lot of talk about Jesus and his disciples and the miracles he performed and the people he healed. But about the Holy Spirit, well, not much was really mentioned about the person of the Holy Spirit. Sure, at Pentecost, we may have mentioned about the Holy Spirit, like we're celebrating today, Pentecost, but really there was nothing at all. Or because I grew up going to a traditional church with my family and the times there wasn't Sunday school, the only time I really heard about the Holy Spirit was when we all recited the creed, which if you come to our nine o'clock service is something we recite every single week, our statement of faith. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. These words have so much power, but they were never unpacked to me what the Holy Spirit is. And staggeringly, looking back now, that was literally when I was growing up, the only mention of the Holy Spirit, a short paragraph at the end of a long creed that I had to recite every Sunday at church. And this, when I think back now, just doesn't make sense. I mean, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, God being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Each is God, but they are one. Now, not to get too doctrinal and sunny Sunday evening, but many theologians call this the perichoresis. It sounds like a really, really fancy word, but actually, what it really means and talks about is that indwelling nature of the Trinity, of the unity and the intimacy that the Trinity all share. Yes, there are three parts to the Trinity, but they are all one. They are all God. Jesus prays in John chapter 17, verse 21, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, 
so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So why in the words of the pastor and author Francis Chan, has there been such a tragic neglect of the Holy Spirit? Of course, I'm not God and I'm really thankful for the journey that God has sent me on so far. But if I encountered maybe the Holy Spirit at a young age when I was a kid, I don't think necessarily, necessarily I wouldn't have gone to church as a teenager growing up. It was only when I went back to church, when I went to university and I encountered the Holy Spirit for the first time and the Spirit called me to put my full hope and trust in Jesus and commit my life to him. That's when I really started to learn and experience the Holy Spirit. You see, it's through the Holy Spirit that our faith is truly made alive. It's not that God the Father and God the Son are irrelevant. That would be heresy. But Jesus did say that when he ascended into heaven, that another was coming. And that another was the Holy Spirit. He promised the Holy Spirit to his disciples and to us today. John 14, verse 15 to 17 says this, and it should have come up on the screens. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. That's the difference the Holy Spirit makes to our lives. He will abide with us and be with us. What intimacy that really speaks of and what Jesus promises to us. The Holy Spirit is why we don't worship a distant and far God over there in the distance. But we worship a God who intimately knows each and every single one of us and wants to know each and every single one of us in an intimate way through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not someone to admire from a long distance and just a person, one person of the Trinity. No, the Holy Spirit is more than just to be known. He is to be received, he is to be encountered, and he is to be followed. The Holy Spirit has really changed my life. Before God was this person up there who dictated life and who I worshipped, now God is someone I not just worship, but someone who I know is with me every step of the way. That when I welcome his presence in Worship, prayer, Bible reading, reading of scripture, I am reminded that I am not alone. As Francis Chan writes again, he says, Empowering his children with the strength of the Holy Spirit is something the Father wants to do. It's not something we have to talk him into. He genuinely wants to see us walk in his strength. God desperately desires He desperately desires that each and every single one of us would know his intimacy and his awesome power by the power of the Holy Spirit. To live each day in the awareness of his wonder and to be challenged and encouraged to be the best version of ourselves that God wants us to be. It's my prayer for you all this evening that you would know afresh the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So what can these three verses of Mark's Gospel that we've just heard, tell us exactly about the Holy Spirit. Well, firstly, the Holy Spirit is not exclusive. The Holy Spirit is not exclusive. There is not one person here who is discounted or disqualified from receiving the Holy Spirit. Jesus' plan right from the start was that the Holy Spirit was to be for everyone. After promising the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in verse 18 of John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's Jesus' promise to each and every single one of us. If you're feeling alone today, if you're feeling like an orphan, step into that promise that with Jesus we are not alone and that through the power of the Holy Spirit we are forever in communion or relationship with God. In verse 9 of our reading today it says, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, I was doing a bit of research into Nazareth, and Nazareth lay close to about seven main different trade routes for easy contact with the outside world. 
And it was a frontier town, and that means there were settlers who would have settled in this town that they'd have moved to. And it was, off, it was quite a remote town as well. It was quite cut off from a lot of places. And one book that I was reading about Nazareth describes Nazareth as quite aloof. That is not very friendly and quite reserved. Basically, Nazareth was quite a forgotten town and somewhere with not the best reputation. But then we read Jesus came from this aloof town in Nazareth and he was baptized and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. A place that Nathaniel, one of his disciples, said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You see, no matter what your story, upbringing or background, the Holy Spirit wants to meet with you. The entrance guidelines for encountering the Holy Spirit is not a strict set of guidelines or a long list of rules. It's rather an openness and willingness to be changed and transformed by his Spirit. In fact, God wants to go through the person of the Holy Spirit to create in us a new creation, allowing and inviting us to grow and to mature into all that he has called us to be. Maybe your story doesn't have the best background. Maybe you come from a place people call quite aloof. Maybe you have had a bit of a Nazareth upbringing. Or maybe you, don't, maybe you have some distaste about where you have come from. But don't let that your background disqualify you from stepping into God's promises for you and his will for your life. He loves you regardless of your background. And he wants you through the power of the Holy Spirit to take you on an amazing journey of adventure with him. The Holy Spirit wants to use our story of brokenness to give us freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, there is freedom. Let's with all our stories step into that freedom that Jesus invites us today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit affirms and equips. Verse 10 of our reading says, And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. Now this happened after John the Baptist was baptized by Jesus in the Jordan. Baptism is about all about that dying to our sin in our lives and rising and being made clean and new by Jesus. Jesus, of course, had no sin in him, but he got baptized to show us the importance and the power of baptism. That if we want to be followers of him, we need to make that public declaration of faith in him. And the Holy Spirit was key in all of this, in this act of baptism. Jesus got baptized and it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit affirmed Jesus by coming down on him and through that affirming the equipping came. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to affirm you so you can be sent out and equipped for the greatest adventure yet of being a follower of Jesus. If you're sitting here and you haven't been baptised, can I encourage you to have a think about being baptised on Summer Sunday on the 30th of June? Or consider doing the Alpha Course next week here on Wednesday evening and learning about this person of Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a thing or a force or a power, but it's a person. It's a person, so a person, so therefore wants to have a relationship with us. The passage describes that relationship as an affirming and an equipping one. It says, a voice from heaven said, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. These amazing words spoken to Jesus are the words he wants to speak to each and every single one of us today. You are my son, the beloved. You are my daughter, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. But these amazing words come after the Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus. And this is one of the most amazing things about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws us closer to the intimacy of the Father whose arms are open wide for all of us. It's where we encounter the very beauty of God and his amazing promises to us. I love how one commentator puts it. 
God is well pleased in him, Jesus. And so by being well pleased in us, he is well pleased through us in him. How beautiful is that? That we are almost invited into that fellowship and unity and beauty of the Trinity where we are all affirmed as children of God and equipped to be sent out to do his will. I had a great time recently going up to the leadership conference in the Royal Albert Hall with a few people here. And it was full of great speakers and worship and seminars, and I really, really enjoyed it. But I was quite surprised, looking back now, how quickly I could hide myself behind the worship and the speakers and the seminars. You see, I love content. I'm like a sponge. I love reading, I love watching, and listening to just about anything. But the problem is, with the amount of content that we have nowadays, and we have access to, we can fill our minds and hearts with a lot of what is out there, which is amazing, it can be really, really good, but that can bury sometimes the real emotions that the Holy Spirit wants to deal with in our lives. And this is something I've been trying to really work on, my emotions. As a type six on the Enneagram, my challenge is to be able to feel things or to feel emotion. Maybe you can relate in how you struggle to find or deal with emotion. Anyway, the last session, um, this speaker gave mostly to just pure silence and inviting people to shout out the things that they were struggling with. You see, when the worship and the speakers and the seminars was all stripped away, all I had left was Jesus. Prompted by the Holy Spirit, I started to write out pages and pages in my notebook, not of great sound bites, of great leadership, or how to run a church effectively, as good as that was, but actually what the Holy Spirit really wants to deal with in my heart. The strongholds I still have, the people I struggle with, the written out plans that I want to cling on to so badly when launching a ministry or doing a ministry, the struggles I have in life, the loss of my dad, the comparisons in ministry, the surrendering of St. Richard's, the surrendering of the future. And after that, there was more ministry time and I felt an encounter with the Holy Spirit like I'd never done before. It's amazing what affirming and equipping the Holy Spirit wants to give us if we just give him the space and the silence to let him work in our lives and hearts. And I can just imagine a similar kind of scenario or picture in the River Jordan for Jesus. All there is in that moment is his Father and the Holy Spirit and John the Baptist. That's all Jesus needed to be sent out for his ministry here on earth. That affirmation of the Father and the equipping of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a great worship band. It wasn't a great pep talk by John the Baptist. But simply just to bask in his Father's presence and delight in him. That's what God wants for his church. His followers to strip away the pools and distractions of this world and to enter into that loving relationship of the Trinity, of the Father who loves us, of his Son, Jesus Christ, who died for you and offers us all that gift of salvation and the Holy Spirit who empowers and equips us to go out and do the Father's will. God wants to remind you today, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he is well pleased with you. No matter what you've done, or no matter what you feel about yourself, he wants you to know that he is well pleased with you. Well pleased with you as his child. Step into that identity today, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God doesn't want to withhold his Holy Spirit from you. Ask the Father and he will give the gift of the Holy Spirit. Luke 11 verse 13 says, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you've never come up for prayer ministry here and want to know afresh the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, maybe can I encourage you to come up, come up and be expectant and ask the Father to give the Holy Spirit to you. It will change your life forever. 
But don't be despondent if nothing happens immediately. God is not limited to the big, miraculous moments. Sometimes because he knows us all intimately and our best, he works in the small, gradual moments too. So the Holy Spirit's not exclusive. The Holy Spirit affirms and equips. And finally, the Holy Spirit sends us out. Guess what? When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's never for our personal glory. It's only to exalt the name of Jesus higher. Jesus says in John 16, verse 14, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, Jesus, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's never to glorify ourselves. It's always to glorify Jesus. To glorify Jesus by stepping out and being obedient to the calling he has on our lives. And by the way, a calling is not just for people up here. A calling is for each and every single person here today. We are all called to go out and tell people of this good news of Jesus. We should be a witness to those who don't know Jesus. Through our encounters with the Holy Spirit, we should seem to be different. We should be more people of peace, more people of joy, and more welcoming. Francis Chan says, I think the worst part is when you get outside the church's walls and interact with believers and non-believers in the same sphere. Can you really tell a difference? If you didn't recognize their face from church, would you know that their actions and lifestyles that they were followers of Jesus. If we were to walk as a church through Queen Square, or I don't know, down the high street in Crawley, people should notice a difference about us because the Holy Spirit is living inside each and every single one of us. Our greatest witness to this town of Crawley is to show we are different, that there is something different about us in the way we lead our lives and our priorities. Today we celebrate Pentecost, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and the church was born. And when the disciples were in the upper room, they were in fear. They weren't strong and courageous people from academic backgrounds with loads of letters after their names. They were mostly fishermen, who back then were the most unacademic people you could meet. Yet still God chose them to send his Holy Spirit on them. There was no exclusivity. There was just affirmation and equipping from the posture of the disciples, having their open hearts and minds. That's what the Holy Spirit loves. He loves someone who's open-minded, with an open heart to see him move and for us to be sent out. God will not go where God is not wanted. He wants someone with an open heart and an open mind to encounter him. So do we want God? Are we desperate for his presence? Do we want to see an outbreak of the Holy Spirit in our lives and his church? Are we hungry for Crawley to know the saving love of Jesus Christ? Then let's step forward in that authority that God has given us, confident that the Holy Spirit is in us and give him the glory. And finally, as we come into land and we give some space for the Holy Spirit to minister to us individually. I felt called as I was coming to the end of preparing for this message about speaking about fear when it comes to the Holy Spirit. I think certainly we can be sometimes in fear when we encounter the Holy Spirit. What's it going to be like? How am I going to feel? What's going to happen? What will it uncover in my life? But I want to encourage you that If you are fearful of the Holy Spirit and encountering him, that's only natural. I remember when I encountered the Holy Spirit for the first time, I was quite in fear. What was it going to be like? It was a bit of an unknown. What will happen? But I think that last point is the key. You see, I think most of the time our fear is not to do with the Holy Spirit himself, but actually perhaps our unwillingness to bring to light the things the Spirit wants to do in our lives. Perhaps the core issue is this. It's less about holding back from God rather than getting too much of him. 
Perhaps if we are fearful of the Holy Spirit, what we're really saying is, God, I don't want you to really go into X or Y of my life. Or perhaps I'll leave that part of my life out of God. But actually, thankfully, it doesn't work that way. God can take every single part of our life and redeem it for his glory. The Holy Spirit is not something to be feared. The Holy Spirit just wants you to grow closer in intimacy with the Father. There is not one part of your life that God doesn't want to transform. Sometimes, if I'm honest, I'd rather God doesn't always know every time I struggle with my dad or I struggle with writing out a plan for ministry rather than trusting in him. Sometimes I'd rather he didn't know. But that is not the Spirit's intention. Here in our reading tonight, we see the Holy Spirit who comes like a dove on Jesus and reveals the love of the Father to him. I love how in the King James Version, the Holy Spirit is described as the almighty comforter. The Holy Spirit is not someone to be afraid of. Instead, it is someone to be embraced and welcomed into every part of our lives. If the band could come up, that would be great. I love this town of Crawley. This year, I'll have been living here for five years and working here at this church for five years. And Jian, my wife, has been living with me for three of those years since we got married. We love this community. We love this town. We love the neighborhoods and just the pure uniqueness of this town. But what we more love seeing is people in Crawley coming to know the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus to see his people find purpose, to encounter the love and power of the Holy Spirit. If we really want to see that vision of love Crawley worked out in this town, that has to start with us. Not by our own strength or not by writing an amazing plan about how we're going to bring people into this church, but it starts by us encountering the Holy Spirit. Not by power, nor by strength, but only by my spirit says the Lord. What good news could you share with someone in Crawley about Jesus? That starts with us being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you. He wants to lead us and guide us in those conversations. But we have to be open and willing ourselves. Don't discount yourself today. The Holy Spirit is not exclusive. Know that he wants to affirm and equip you and send you out. But also don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. All the Holy Spirit wants to do is to draw you closer to the love of God and empower you for your life. Amen. Shall we stand? If I can invite Steve up as well, that'd be great. So I'm just going to pray a prayer, very simple prayer, but a very powerful.